Good evening and welcome. It is presently Tuesday, September 7th, 2021, at 12.34 a.m. Tonight we shall be reading Unintended Consequences by John Ross, Part 2K, Growth Continued. For this recording session, we shall begin with Chapter 89, Violation, August 14th, 1971. This chapter begins on page 267 of the ebook edition and page 311 of the softcover print edition. Before we begin, let me first apologize for the extended hiatus of five or six months that this project has gone on. Such is due to a variety of reasons, not least of which being that this current section is actually being recorded now for the second time. Unfortunately, the original got deleted during the editing process by mistake, which was quite irritating to say the least. As things stand currently, I expect to be able to unveil a new chapter of roughly two hours of finished length once per month. I would also like to give a shout out to my Patreon page. Friendly reminder that those of you subscribed to my Patreon page can download the audio for each chapter and can gain early access to uploaded chapters as they are produced. Link to my Patreon will be found in the video description below. Thank you. Now then, without further ado, let us begin. This is Unintended Consequences, a novel by John Ross, part 2K, Growth Continued, here on page 267 of the ebook edition and page 311 of the softcover print edition, we have Chapter 89, Violation, August 14th, 1971. Jesus, I hate this sometimes, Henry Bowman thought as his feet pounded the gravel. He had never been more than an average runner, and getting tossed off an overturning hay truck the previous summer and breaking his left leg in two places hadn't helped. I told that moron I should drive, and he should be up top, Henry thought remembering the event. With the aid of some surgical steel, Henry's leg had healed without complications, although it still felt a little different than his right one. He had been able to play rugby this past spring. Every time he did, though, Henry wished he had more speed. It was always frustrating to be unable to catch a rival player that had the ball. Henry doubted that running out to the highway every night during summer break was going to make him much faster, but he hoped his endurance would increase. That would help, and not just on the rugby field. I ought to be able to carry more ammo up the mountains out in Idaho, he told himself as the burning in his lungs increased. Lug the lottie around better too. He was approaching the turnoff that led towards a recently constructed subdivision. Henry always took the turn and sprinted the final 500 yards to complete his workout, then walked back home to cool down. When Henry left the main road, the telephone pole that marked the end of his three-mile run came into view over a quarter mile off the highway. Henry commanded his legs to pick up the pace. It was after 11 p.m., or 2300 hours and traffic in the area was non-existent at that hour. Going out at night was the only way Henry could make himself run regularly during the summer months. Late as it was, the temperature was well over 80 degrees Fahrenheit, about 26.6 degrees Celsius. Henry Bowman's final effort was at a six-minute mile pace. This was all he could muster, even knowing that the end was less than a minute away. The increased wind on his face and chest felt good, but did little to actually cool him off in the August heat. Almost there, slowpoke, he told himself as sweat filled his eyes and blurred the image of the phone pole less than a hundred yards distant. He felt a faint exhilaration in addition to his exhaustion, and was reminded of the punchline to an old joke. It feels so good when I stop. <laughs> Henry Bowman wiped the sweat out of his eyes and pumped his arms in the final push, commanding his legs to maintain the sprint that was threatening to make him collapse. You fucking weenie, he cursed himself silently. Half the guys on the team wouldn't even be breathing hard yet. <laughs> he pounded out the last few steps, slapped the pole, and forced himself to walk rather than flop down in the gravel. His eyes were squeezed shut, and blood was pounding in his ears. And this was why Henry Bowman did not realize he was not alone. Ugh. Huh? Ugh. Henry grunted in alarm as the four men hit him almost simultaneously and drove him into the trees beside the road. For the barest instant, Henry thought he was hallucinating that he was actually in a rugby game. 
He opened his mouth to yell, but before any sound could come out, he was slammed face first into the trunk of a maple tree. The pain was so great, Henry was certain that his nose had just been broken, though in fact, it had not. He collapsed face down in the grass and twigs as one of the men drove a knee between Henry's shoulder blades, forcing air from Henry's lungs and pinning him to the earth. Henry felt that he was suffocating, and he fought off an overpowering urge to vomit. Had he known what was going to happen next, however, he would have encouraged that reflex. Henry felt his gym shorts ripped away, and all of a sudden he realized in absolute horror what was about to happen to him. An image of the ravaged young blonde-haired girl from three years prior appeared, unbidden in his mind. He flailed out with his one free arm, but the man on top of him grabbed his wrist easily and twisted his arm until an audible pop signaled that he had dislocated Henry's right shoulder. <laughs> yeah. The man chuckled when it happened. Much later, Henry would decide that it was really the man's laughter that made it so awful. But at that instant, the pain was worse than anything Henry Bowman had ever felt in his life. It was several orders of magnitude greater than what he had experienced when they had slid him onto the sheet of plywood out in the alfalfa field the year before, with his leg at a funny angle and an evil-looking bulge at the side of his calf muscle. The combination of pain, physical exhaustion, and lack of oxygen to his brain started to induce unconsciousness in Henry Bowman. So this is what dying feels like was Henry's last thought as a blackness began to swallow him whole. Fuck, I think we killed him, came the coarse whisper as the man on Henry's back jumped off, twisted Henry's head towards him, and peered into his face. <laughs> nah, still breathing, he said with relief. Ah, oh, this wouldn't kill nobody, one of the others answered. Just leave him a little sore is all. <laughs> that got a laugh from all four of them. Let's see if we can wake him up. With that, the man who had made the joke produced an empty beer bottle he had brought along. He held the bottle in position with his left hand and slammed the heel of his right hand into its base. The shock to Henry's system, coupled with the fact that his lungs had been working without restriction for 15 or 20 seconds, brought him abruptly back to consciousness. <gasps> he started to lift his head and scream involuntarily when his face was slammed into the dirt again cutting off the sound before it could escape with any volume. The man who had been kneeling on Henry's back laid a hand gently, almost caressingly, on Henry's neck. Then he held the point of a kitchen knife into the back of Henry's jawbone, just below his right ear. Be still now, the knife man whispered, softly, as if to a lover. Keep them eyes shut tight and maybe we won't have to cut them, all right? <laughs> Don't bust the neck of that bottle off inside, one of the others advised. That wouldn't be no fun. The owl monster ain't that tough. You got that right, came the happy reply. He gave the bottle a few more whacks and then tossed it aside, noting with satisfaction that the top half of it was bloody. All right, who's first? What seemed to Henry Bowman like an eternity was, in fact, well under an hour. When he realized that he was not going to lose consciousness again, Henry wished that he would die. After the first man finished and the second started in, Henry knew that was not going to come to pass. And the thought of living as a blind man filled him with a despair such as he had never imagined. Soon after that, however, a very strange thing happened. The pain and terror and utter physical helplessness inflicted upon Henry Bowman did not diminish but his capacity to endure those things increased a tiny bit. It increased just enough that a small part of Henry's mind was able to think of something other than how his insides and his shoulder were screaming, as if they were being torn apart. He was able to think of something other than what was being done to him, and something other than how the men might well blind him when they were through. A small part of Henry Bowman's brain was able to focus on a way to fight back, and hurt at least one of these men hurt him, and maybe kill him. A spark glowed, and soon that spark ignited, like pyrite stuck against steel in the presence of dry wood shavings. The small flame became a larger flame, and the larger flame turned into a roaring blaze whose heat and light did not eliminate Henry's pain, but dulled it, and made it seem as if it were something that he was watching happen to someone else. 
Henry Bowman realized that there was one potentially dangerous part of his body over which he still had complete control, and he intended to use it to the fullest extent possible. One of them has to want me to suck him, Henry thought. One of them has to. He willed it with every shred of faith he possessed, and as he did so, Henry worked at controlling the jaw muscles that had been spasmatically clenched in agony. By thinking of nothing else, Henry found that he could open and close his mouth at will. He found he could snap his jaw shut instantly, grind his teeth one side at a time, or slide his jaw sideways with his teeth clenched. For the next 27 minutes, Henry Bowman practiced each of these exercises dozens of times. For 27 minutes, Henry Bowman imagined that he was ignoring his gag reflex as he did when the doctor stuck a dry tongue depressor down his throat every time he got strep. Only this one won't be dry, he told himself over and over. I'll have my blood on it. Come on, you bastards. One of you has to finish that way. It'll only take me a second to do it. I could clip six inches off an axe handle right about now. Just one of you. That's all. Please. Just one. God. Henry Bowman was still praying for his chance when the high beams of a 1964 Pontiac Catalina seemed to turn night into day. 19-year-old Jimmy Weir had just dropped his 16-year-old girlfriend Shelly off at her house in time to squeak her under the midnight curfew her father had imposed. Now he was racing back home before his own father blew a gasket. Jimmy Weir's high beams were on because he had bumped the foot switch while he and Shelly were necking. When the hour had become late and he had started the car to take her home, Jimmy Weir's mind had been filled with powerful thoughts, but none of them involved roadway etiquette. The big Pontiac had a limited slip differential, and when Jimmy Weir stabbed the throttle, both rear tires broke loose, slewing the tail of the car to the right. David Webb would have stayed on the throttle, given the wheel a touch of the opposite lock, let the tires find traction, and powered out of the skid. David Webb, however, was not driving. Jimmy Weir stood on the brakes. The big V8 stalled and the Catalina came to rest in the center of the road, pointed about 30 degrees left of the direction it had been traveling. Its headlights illuminated an area near where the gang rape was taking place. Fuck, cops, one of the four men exclaimed, logically assuming that any car that slewed to a stop near the scene of a crime with its high beams on had to be trouble. Trees prevented a clear view of them and their actions, but the area was no longer pitch dark. All four of them ran. Jimmy Weir was too startled to notice anything that was happening 15 yards off the roadway. He looked frantically around the car, assuring himself that he had not damaged it in some way before turning the key, restarting the engine, and proceeding home at a much more sedate pace. Henry Bowman tried to stand and call for help. But before he could get to his feet, he heard the car drive away. He hoped that his attackers were gone for good, but he knew that there was no assurance of that. Distance was his only real ally now. Something's wrong with my ankle, he realized. Can't use my right arm either. Using his knees and his left arm, Henry Bowman started to crawl towards home. New chapter here. Here on page 270 of the ebook edition and 314 of the softcover print edition, we have Chapter 90, Shame, August 15th, 1971. It took Henry Bowman almost six hours to get back to the house. He pulled himself up to the door of the wood frame building and let himself in. Thank God Mom's out of town, he thought, for perhaps the tenth time in five hours. He saw that he had dripped some blood on the wooden floor of the narrow hallway. Gotta clean that up, he told himself. There was one downstairs bath, and it was at the end of the hall. Henry pulled himself towards it, crawled through the doorway, and turned on the bathtub taps with his left hand. For five hours, he had had the overwhelming desire to wash the blood and filth from his body, and he had had the irrational fear that he would never be clean again. Henry took a steel nail file from the vanity cabinet and managed to cut off his t-shirt with his left hand. The torn gym shorts that he had tied crudely to his jock strap came off next. Henry climbed into the tub without making any attempt to remove his shoes or socks and let the water level slowly rise to cover his battered body. Lying in the cool water was the first thing that had ever felt a little bit pleasant in what seemed like an eternity. While he soaked, Henry focused on how the water felt, 
and tried to ignore the fact that it was starting to exhibit a slight pink tint. He also tried not to think about his shoulder. Breakfast of champions. <laughs> Henry Bowman thought with an inward chuckle as he noticed that the sun was starting to appear on the horizon. He was naked except for his shoes and socks, and was sitting on two towels so he wouldn't get blood on the kitchen chair. The liquor cabinet hadn't been opened in at least a year, but Henry Bowman found it well stocked, mostly with unopened bottles. Henry Bowman had had ample opportunity to drink beer in college, but his first bottle had also been his last. He hated the taste. Henry had also once tried a Scotch on the Rocks, which was his Uncle Max Collins's drink of choice. One sip of that had been enough to convince him that there were some personal preferences that were utterly beyond his comprehension. Looking through the dusty cabinet, he had recalled that gin and 7-Up was a drink he had heard several people order at a party his mother had given for some of her friends. Henry liked the soft drink and had decided the mixing of it with gin was worth a try. On the table in front of him was a quart bottle of gin that was now half full. Sitting beside two empty 7-Up bottles and a plastic bucket with a few slivers of ice floating in some very cold water. Henry could see his reflection in the black glass of the double-stack oven across the kitchen. His dislocated shoulder was very prominent, and the bottles and ice bucket in front of him made the image surreal. The bartender from hell, Henry thought as he touched his glass to his lips and tipped it up. The cold liquid coursed down his throat, straight from Aphrodite's breast. Tastes even better than the first one did. He drained the glass, then poured a slug of straight gin into it and took a swallow. It burns. Needs more 7-Up. He looked over towards the refrigerator. His ankle felt good enough to walk on, for a few yards at least. He stood up and dizziness swept over him. Better to do the other thing first, while I can still function, he decided. With unsteady steps, Henry made it over to the wrought iron pot rack which hung by a short length of one quarter inch chain from a steel plate in the ceiling. His father had installed it in 1964 and Henry knew that the plate was held in place by two 3 8 inch lag bolts which went through the plaster and screwed five inches into one of the 2 by 10 joists that held up the second floor. Henry smiled as he climbed on the chair. Thanks for building a pot rack you could hook a block and tackle to and use to pull an engine swap, Dad. Thanks for building a pot rack you could hook a block and tackle to and use to pull an engine swap, Dad. He reached for the free end of the plastic-coated electric extension cord he had earlier looped through the chain. The chain creaked under his weight of 190 pounds, about 86.18 kilos. The chair creaked under his weight of 190 pounds, about 86.18 kilos. If anyone else had done it, the damn thing might rip out of the ceiling and fall on my head. <laughs> Henry tied the knot in the extension cord as best he could with his left hand. Hope it holds. He pulled on the cord and it bit into his skin. Probably tear it some. No matter. Henry made a last test to see that the cord was taut and took a deep breath. He had thought it through for several hours now, and there just wasn't any choice. If you got a frog to swallow, best not to look at it too long, he thought. Henry Bowman clenched his teeth and fists and abruptly threw himself off the chair with a twisting motion. There was a loud crack, and then blackness. When Henry Bowman regained consciousness, his whole right side was screaming in protest, but it was his right hand that screamed loudest. When he opened his eyes, the room was blurred and sideways, and his stomach was doing some very unpleasant things. Henry was hanging by his right wrist, connected to the chain in the ceiling by the electrical cord. His knees were almost touching the linoleum floor. With considerable effort, Henry got his left leg under him and managed to stand up. This took all the tension taken off the cord. Henry's right wrist and shoulder still hurt, but not quite as much. He examined his right hand. It was almost the color of eggplant. Jesus, how long was I out for? Henry wondered. He rotated his shoulder, noting with satisfaction that, although it hurt like hell, it seemed to work all right. Then he set to untying the extension cord from his right wrist. It took longer than he expected, for when he had tied the cord, he had had the presence of mind to wrap it tightly several times above the bone, 
so that his makeshift technique would not dislocate his right wrist in the process of fixing his shoulder. When he finished unwrapping the cord, Henry was rewarded with the sensation that a thousand tiny needles were being jabbed into his swollen right hand. He flexed his fingers repeatedly, watching them closely. Wouldn't do to lose the use of my trigger finger, he thought with a smile. It was the amusement that comes from being either exhausted or drunk, and Henry Bowman was both. He walked unsteadily back towards his seat at the kitchen table, then remembered he needed 7-Up to mix with his gin. He retrieved two more bottles from the refrigerator, popped the caps off on a drawer handle, and set them on the table next to the liquor. He filled his glass with ice from the freezer and set about the serious business of finishing the rest of the alcohol. The bottle was not quite empty, but Henry Bowman's bladder demanded emptying, and so he staggered to the bathroom. He leaned against the wall and began to relieve himself in the toilet. It was then that he saw the blood in his urine. One end stops and the other starts, he thought as he squeezed his eyes shut. Fuck. Henry flushed the toilet and then lay down on the bathroom tile floor, still naked except for shoes and socks. He curled himself into a ball, and soon his body was racked with violent, uncontrollable sobs. <laughs> I didn't do anything, he said to himself over and over. He was filled with an immense shame. <laughs> No, I didn't do anything. No, why? <laughs> he was filled with an immense shame. To be sure, Henry felt shame for the terrible thing that he had been forced to endure, but there was something else that made it much worse. It was something that Henry Bowman had been trying without success to forget ever since the moment that the car had arrived and the four men had fled. Henry Bowman knew beyond any doubt whatsoever that the men who had attacked him would do the exact same thing again to someone else. Of this fact, he was absolutely certain. Just as he knew that winter would arrive in four or five months and that it would be hot again this time next year. Those men would do it again. And again after that, and when they did, their next victim might not be able to crawl home. Their next victim might not be left with their eyesight, Henry knew, and he had to fight to keep from vomiting. And I didn't do anything. I didn't hurt them. I didn't mark a one of them. I didn't even keep my eyes open so I could see what they looked like. Henry Bowman knew in his heart of hearts that he was not the final victim of the four men he had encountered that night. And he was absolutely right about that fact. More victims followed. There were several other things, however, that Henry Bowman did not know. At least, not yet. Henry Bowman did not know, but would eventually come to learn, that men comprised a full 10% of all rape victims in the United States of America, and almost a third of the victims of gang rapes. Henry Bowman did not know that one day he would actually consider himself lucky that what had happened to him that night had occurred in 1971 and not decades later. By that time, the AIDS virus would guarantee that any homosexual gang rape that caused rectal bleeding was a virtual death sentence for the victim. Last of all, Henry Bowman did not know that the reason he had never seen his late father take a drink was not as he had always assumed that Walter Bowman had not liked alcoholic beverages. That was not true at all. The reason that Walter Bowman had shunned liquor all of his life was that the people on his side of the family, particularly the men, had a genetic predisposition towards alcoholism. New chapter here. Here at the start of page 273 of the ebook edition, and page 317 of the softcover print edition, we have Chapter 91, Externalities, November 10th, 1971. Henry, your grades have fallen off a cliff compared to what we've come to expect from you. I'm looking at a C- average for this semester. James Nelson knew something was wrong. Lots of students had similar grades, particularly those who spent class hours at war protests. Few, however, had had B-plus averages the entire previous year. 
Henry Bowman looked at his faculty advisor. There wasn't much he wanted to say. I I've had some personal problems this year, you might say, Henry said quietly. Like I have nightmares every night, I can't get it up, my girlfriend kissed me off, and I'm sick to death of classes, he added silently. Is it this double major you're working on? Nelson asked. You know, that kind of commitment, it would be much better if you eased off on one or the other, and did a real job on the one that's the most important to you. Henry smiled sadly and shook his head. That's not it, it's other things. Look, I'm in a slump right now, Professor Nelson. That happens to people, doesn't it? He asked reasonably. Don't worry, it's not terminal, he added with a grin. Hmm, I suppose you're right, James Nelson said, but was not at all convinced. I'll see you on Thursday, Henry said brightly as he turned to leave the man's office. Gotta get some ice cream from the dining hall, he thought. Maybe one of the guys that works there can scare up a lime for me too. Then I'll hit up a couple more cemeteries. New chapter here. Here at the start of page 274 of the ebook edition and page 318 of the softcover print edition, we have chapter 92, Obliteration of the Self and Rebirth, December 20th, 1971. Henry Bowman had never flown with a hangover before, and he didn't like it. It was the first time he could ever remember flying a plane and not enjoying himself. The fact that he had the major part of a ten-hour cross-country ahead of him did not make things any better. Why didn't I ease off last night? He asked himself for the fourth or fifth time since takeoff. Winter flying was normally smooth, but there was a fair amount of turbulence in the air, and that irritated Henry also. Since when do bumpy conditions bother an acrobatic pilot, huh, dipshit? <laughs> he glanced at the altimeter and saw that his altitude was almost a hundred above his intended level of 8,500 feet, and he shook his head in disgust. Thank God my father isn't alive to see me right now, he thought as he eased the stick forward a millimeter and put the piper into a slight descent. Feeling much better, Henry thought with a smile as the city of Pittsburgh slowly disappeared behind him. He pulled the six new birth certificates out of his pocket and looked at them once more. Henry had no idea what he was going to do with the documents, but it had been an adventure getting them, along with social security numbers and other attendant proofs of legitimacy. Henry had spent much of the last two months on his spy project, as he thought of it. Occasionally during that time, he worried that because of what had happened to him the previous summer, he had developed an unhealthy fixation on trying to take absolute control of his future. He knew, intellectually at least, that no person could insulate himself entirely from random events. The fact was, though, that in the fall of 1971, Henry Bowman had lost interest in almost all things in his life except drinking gin and pursuing the secret project he had undertaken. And the alternative ID scheme was fun. It occupied Henry's mind and stimulated his creativity at a time when everything else seemed excruciatingly boring. After the unexpected success of acquiring the first birth certificate, Henry had decided to get others, of slightly different ages, from other areas. The game metamorphosed into one where Henry Bowman imagined himself with a lithesome female companion. The game metamorphosed into one where Henry Bowman imagined himself with a lithesome female companion. And that led to getting birth certificates for three dead girls in addition to the ones of the deceased boys. And that led to getting birth certificates for the three dead girls in addition to the ones for the deceased boys. The three boys had been born in 1949, 1952, and 1956, and had all died between 1950 and 1958. Two of the three girls had been born in 1955 and died that same year. The third had died at the age of two days in 1961. The birth certificates had been sent to six different addresses in Massachusetts, Connecticut, and Virginia, which was not inconvenient for a young man who had an airplane that carried a 10-speed bike with quick detachable hubs. The birth certificates had been sent to six different addresses in Massachusetts, Connecticut, and Virginia, 
which was not inconvenient for a young man who had an airplane that carried a 10-speed bike with quick detachable hubs. Henry glanced at his fuel gauges, about half since the last fuel stop. He looked over his shoulder to make sure nothing was lying in the back of the plane. Henry Bowman's classmates had been very amused by the fact that Henry had sent his clothes home ahead of him via UPS so he could fly home for Christmas break in an empty plane. Good reason for that. Henry thought as he made a few clearing turns, then lowered the nose and watched as the airspeed built to 150 miles per hour. Henry abruptly gave the engine full throttle and pulled the stick back in his lap, releasing back pressure when the plane was exactly vertical. Henry took quick glances at the horizon and the airspeed indicator while keeping the plane on the exact path with tiny movements of the stick and rudder. When his airspeed was almost zero, he gave the airplane full left rudder, executing a hammerhead turn. The clipwing cub pivoted on the axis described by Henry's spine and pointed straight at the ground. Henry then chopped the throttle to idle, pulling the stick back in his lap again and gave the cub full right rudder. This stalled the right wing, putting the plane into a vertical snap roll. After one full revolution, Henry reversed the rudder pedals and shoved the stick forward breaking the plane out of the snap roll after one and a half turns. He let the speed build for two more seconds, then pulled the stick smoothly back into his lap and pulled out of the vertical dive on his original heading. Not bad, Henry told himself with a smile. He avoided thinking about how the same maneuver would have made him feel four hours earlier. Henry also avoided thinking about the dismal performance he had turned in on three of his final exams for the semester. New chapter here. Here on page 275 of the ebook edition and page 320 of the softcover print edition, we have. Here on page 275 of the ebook edition and page 320 of the softcover print edition, we have. Chapter 93 Internship to Corruption and Confidence and Commiseration at the AA Meet. December 29th. 1971. Uh, hello? Dick, Dick. Dick, is that you? It's Joe Hammond. How are your holidays going? Uh, yeah, real good, Mr. Hammond. Let me go get Mom. <laughs> no, 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 no. Hold up, son. She's probably busy, and I've only got a minute. It's you I called to talk to. Oh? Dick Gaines said warily into the phone. Yeah, Hammond said expansively. He had several drinks in him. Thought I'd see if you were interested in an internship for the first half of this coming summer. Congressman Sloan said he could use another good man the last couple of months before the end of the season, when things get kinda wild. Con Congressman Sloan? In... in Washington? Dick Gaines asked in amazement. That's the one, alright. Actually what he needs is a couple more bodies on the payroll to help cover his tracks on the dough he's been stealing. But you don't need to know about that, <laughs> Hammond added. Oh, yes! Yes, of course! Yes, yes, yes! Yes, Keynes exclaimed! Yes, yes, yes! Then his face fell. I don't know if Mom and Dad'll let me, though. Oh, I already squared it with them for you. Merry Christmas, Dick. A few days late, mind you. <laughs> Dick Gaines was speechless. That's wonderful, Mr. Hammond, he said finally. Thank you so much. Oh, no trouble at all. Give your mother my love. See ya. Bye. Uh, bye, Gaines said softly as he heard the line disconnect. Congressman Sloan! The thought thrilled him. Then he frowned. Now I gotta make sure I pass algebra next semester so I don't have to take any summer school classes again, he thought. Later... Henry, you're an alcoholic. Now just what in the hell are you talking about? The accusation had taken him entirely by surprise, and it made him very angry. I can smell it on you right now, Carol Wilson said without backing down. You've had a lot to drink today already, and it's barely six o'clock. Carol Weston was Henry Bowman's closest female friend from high school. They had been in dramatics class together, and Henry had thought her high school boyfriend was a jerk. Now Carol had a new college boo she had met at her school in Florida. 
From what she had told him about the fellow, Henry thought he sounded okay. Henry turned sideways in the seat of his mother's Buick station wagon and took another bite out of his hamburger. He was trying to appear relaxed instead of upset. Oh, for God's sake, Carol, I didn't even drink beer in high school. Come on. Now I come back home from my sophomore year in college during Christmas break, there's parties just about every night, I have a few drinks like everybody else, and now, sitting here in the parking lot at a steak and shake, you say I'm an alcoholic? Where in the hell does that come from? You've changed, Henry. I might not have noticed, or I might have thought it was because all of us are off in college now and we're all a little different from the way we were in high school. Except my mother became an alcoholic after daddy left. And when I see you now, I see a difference. And it's exactly the same thing I saw in her. And it worries me. I can't believe I'm hearing this, Henry said in amazement. Have I been mean to you or anyone else? Have you seen me yelling or staggering around or have my hands been shaking or... Henry tried to think of other things that alcoholics did. Or, or anything like that, he said finally. You were almost half an hour late to Kelly's house Monday night. Late? How can you be half an hour late to a party? <laughs> That's ridiculous. Henry, every party you ever went to when we were in school together, you showed up exactly at the time on the invitation. All of us girls used to laugh about it. One time I was helping with Irene Cohen's party and you showed up at her house at six minutes after seven. I told her that her clock was probably six minutes fast, and when she called time and temperature, it was. So since I used to show up at parties exactly on time, and now I arrive 20 minutes late, that means I'm an alcoholic? Henry was smiling, and Carol Weston wanted to join him, but she held her ground. When did you start drinking today? She demanded. I haven't been drinking today, he lied. If you smell liquor on me, it's what I had at my aunt's house last night, sweating out of me. Carol Weston nodded in acceptance. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have said anything. Is there any in the car right now? I could use a little something, even if you're not going to have one. No, I'm afraid there isn't. Henry lied again. What made her guess I'd have a bottle under the back seat, he wondered. Okay, fine. No big deal. She picked up some more french fries and put them in her mouth. You been flying your plane much? she asked, changing the subject. Every week, he answered. Actually, more like every other week lately. Flew at home, Henry added with a shrug. That's ten hours, almost. Carol Weston began to get an idea. You still do those stunts? she asked. Henry had taken Carol flying the previous summer and had shown her a loop, a snap roll, and finally a five-turn spin. She had been both terrified and exhilarated, particularly by the last maneuver. Sure, if you want. Take me right now, she said suddenly. Take me up in your plane and do that thing where everything whirls around and I thought I was going to die. <laughs> it's called a spin, Henry corrected. He shook his head. Carol, it's dark out. I don't do aerobatics at night. It's not safe. You can get disoriented too easily. That's a good way to get killed. <laughs> Carol snorted. <laughs> Carol snorted. You told me when we did it that day last summer that all you had to do was push the rudder the other way and let go of everything, and the plane would start flying okay by itself. Isn't that what you said? Well, yes, but... Then let's go! You said you'd take me anywhere I wanted to go tonight, so long as we didn't have to get dressed up. I want to go do a spin in your plane. Henry Bowman shook his head. No. If you take me up in your airplane right now and do a spin, I'll go to bed with you, Carol said suddenly. She had not decided what she would do if he said yes. What? 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 Henry Bowman exclaimed as he almost choked on his hamburger. You always had a crush on me in high school, she said quickly. I knew it all the time, and you even admitted it to me last summer. Take me flying, and then we'll go to bed together. What do you say? 
Carol, Henry said, completely overwhelmed by the way the evening was going. You've got that new guy from Roland's Bill, isn't it? That you're crazy about. You can't just... Henry Bowman, you are the biggest liar in the whole world. Carol Weston almost shouted. When in your life have you ever cared about what some other guy felt when it came to going after a girl? Particularly a guy you've never even met. Henry's mouth opened, but nothing came out. Carol was right, and he was dumbstruck. You've been drinking today, and that's why you won't take me flying now, isn't it? You can drive a car when you're about to pass out. You can go slow, and maybe you'll scrape the curve, but everything will be okay. I should know. Mom used to do it all the time. But if you take me flying and something goes wrong, we'll both die. And you know it. Henry nodded. Okay, okay. I did drink today, yeah. Carol said nothing. Most of the afternoon, off and on, he added. She remained silent. <sighs> I won't fly with liquor still in my system. He shook his head. Let the nose stay down a little too long coming out of some maneuvers, you can overspeed the airframe in a hurry. Make the tail come right off. He looked up at his friend and smiled. Carol saw that his eyes were wet. <laughs> I may show up late for parties now and worry about what out-of-town boyfriends might think, but I won't fly a plane with alcohol in my bloodstream, Carol. I, I, I just won't do it. Carol Weston took his hand and squeezed it. What happened to you, Henry? She said softly. <sighs> Henry Bowman took a deep breath. He wanted to tell her, but his shame was so thick it was palpable, and he found he could not talk about the rape. He ended up giving Carol an edited version of what had happened that night in August. The attack by the four men was revised into one of terrible violence, but without the sexual component. The gang's motive was unknown, although since it was night, mistaken identity was possible. Henry explained that he had received a severe beating, which was true enough, and that the men had run when a car had come by and shone its bright lights on them, which was true as well. Henry told Carol Weston that he had nightmares about that night but that alcohol seemed to prevent them. This was also true. However, the last time Henry Bowman had gone to sleep completely sober had been over a month ago, so he could not honestly say that the nightmares were still returning whenever he quit drinking. He admitted this fact also. Have you ever gone back on your word? Carol asked after they had talked for a while. No. Not that I know of. I wonder where this is heading, he thought. Then I'm going to hold you to it. We're going someplace tonight where you don't have to get dressed up. I go there with Mom sometimes, and we might run into someone I'd like you to meet. He's a pilot for TWA, and he goes there a lot. They've got good coffee, which I know you hate, but I happen to like it, and you can drink sodas. It's not far from here. Let's go. Guess I'd better shut up and do what she says, Henry told himself. I just hope she was kidding about going to bed. I don't need another disaster tonight, Christ. Okay, tell me where to turn, Henry said as he twisted the key in the ignition and started the engine. East on Clayton Road past the movie theater to Bellevue, she replied. Henry Bowman was about to go to his first AA meeting at Alcoholics Anonymous. New chapter here. Here on page 278 of the ebook edition and page 323 of the softcover print edition, we have chapter 94, Angola, Principles of Self-Defense and Avoiding the Road to Serfdom. March 10th, 1972. More dead, Ray, near the border. Ray Johnson looked over at his head tracker. There were three nationalist groups in Angola. The Popular Movement for the Liberation of Angola, or MPLA, the Front for the Liberation of Angola, FNLA, and the Union for Total Independence of Angola, or UNITA. 
it was this last group that was most prevalent in the local area. Contrary to what was implied by the names of the three groups, all of them spent most of their time fighting amongst themselves despite the fact that their goals were, in theory at least, similar. More and more often, internal disagreements amongst the leaders and the members were turning bloody. How many? Raymond asked. Ten, maybe twenty. Johnson shook his head. Damn bohunks are gonna get tired of putting up with this shit one of these days. Thank God all my real friends are in Rhodesia. He looked around at the camp he and his workers had built. Been a good nine years. Time to get serious about moving on. Ray Johnson's premonition was accurate. Two years later, the Portuguese military would enact a coup and Portugal would immediately grant its Angolan colonies independence. The three nationalist groups would continue their war. The three nationalist groups would continue their war, with the United States of America and China supporting the FNLA, the Soviet Union and Cuba assisting the MPLA, and South Africa backing UNITA. Over a decade later, the FNLA would fade away and the other two groups would continue their fighting. By that time, however, Ray Johnson would be long gone. That fucking confuses me. What the fuck? Chinese and the Americans backing the same... Actually... <clears throat> the three nationalist groups would continue their war, with the United States of America and People's Republic of China supporting the FNLA the Soviet Union and Cuba assisting the MPLA, and South Africa backing UNITA. Over a decade later, the FNLA would fade away and the other two groups would continue their fighting. By that time, however, Ray Johnson would be long gone. By that time, however, Ray Johnson would be long gone. Elsewhere, man, that was bizarre, wasn't it? What do you mean? Henry Bowman asked as they walked out of the men's room and headed for the exit door. Five-hour documentaries were taxing on the bladder even when they were shown on successive nights. Just the whole way the French reacted. I mean, those were Nazis for God's sake. Did you catch some of what they were saying? Unfucking believable The young man shook his head at the thought. At Amherst, as at most colleges, Films shown for specific courses were open to all students so long as seats were available. At Henry's urging, he and another geology major had just spent two nights viewing a film that one of the European history classes had screened, entitled The Sorrow and the Pity. It was a Swiss documentary on occupied France during World War II. You have to realize, many people saw those Nazis the same way we see policemen. What are you talking about? Well, Henry said, cops are around, but the place isn't crawling with them, right? Here in the good old USA, I mean. Yeah? Same way in most of France back in 1942. Especially if you lived in the south part of the country. For most people, life was pretty much the same as before. You lived in the same house, went to the same grocer, the same doctor, had the same job, all of that. You just kept your head down and went on. Henry thought of something. Look, when you glance in your rearview mirror and see a police car behind you, you wish he wasn't there, right? You don't want him around, do you? And it isn't just you. Your parents probably pay loads of taxes and they feel the same way, right? I mean, yeah, I guess so. But what would you or your dad do if someone riding in the back of your car said, Oh Christ, a goddamn cop's following us! And leaned out the window and blasted him. You'd shit your pants, right? Henry was becoming animated. And if you saw some stranger kill a cop, the same cop who just gave you a speeding ticket because he had to make his ticket quota, what would you do? Would you clap and say, good riddance, asshole? Hell no! You'd immediately report it. You'd give a full description and you'd read in the paper about the patrolman's fine record. You'd hear about the number of arrests he made, and how he'd been promoted to lieutenant sooner than anyone else in his class at the academy and what a good husband and father he was. And you'd see a picture of his grieving widow and three fatherless kids, and you'd feel real sorry for him. Even though, at the same time, you're trying to figure out what to do about car insurance since you got cancelled. It was the same way with the Nazis. To most French people, the Krauts were just policemen giving speeding tickets and roughing up long-haired war protesters, 
and the guys in the Resistance were kinda like the Black Panthers. Except with correct grammar and better tasting breakfasts. <laughs> he added as an afterthought. I can't believe that, the friend said. The Nazis weren't police, they killed their own citizens. Henry turned to face his friend and shook his head. <laughs> you don't think cops in this country 35 years ago helped lynch black guys? Weren't those guys citizens here? <laughs> Come on. Nazis were just police in a police state. They had wives and kids and worried about paying the mortgage and whether they'd get laid after a hard day's work at the death camp just like Deputy Billy Bob in Alabama worries about making the payment on his pickup truck while he's wiping the blood off his nigger knocker. <laughs> Henry gathered his thoughts and went on. Look, Hitler's goal was to rule all of Europe, not destroy it, right? What did that mean? Think about it. It meant crushing the dissenters, not killing off everyone piecemeal. People like our parents? Hell, Krauts left him alone. Gave him brownie points when they ratted out the troublemakers. You're from Chicago. Did your parents or any of their friends have anything to worry about during the 1968 convention? No, they didn't have long hair and they weren't out holding up protest signs. I bet some of them were even glad to see those irritating hippies get their heads busted. Am I right? <laughs> Henry went on before his friend could answer. Hell, you know the history, Henry said, unaware that his friend did not. After Poland fell in 1939, Denmark and Norway rolled over for the Krauts in 1940. Took a week or so. Luxembourg taken in a day. Holland lasted about five. Belgians held out for two weeks, then caved in. Brits sent troops to northern France to try and help the frogs fight off the Germans. France lasted a few weeks, and the only reason it took that long instead of a day or two was that Joe Stalin kept half the German army occupied on the Russian front, losing about 10 million soldiers of his own in the process, mind you. As soon as the Krauts drove the Brits away at Dunkirk, France rolled over and spread her legs right now. Germans went into Paris unopposed in June of 1940. Italy said it was neutral. But when Mussolini saw the Krauts were about to kick off their shoes and put their feet up in the Louvre, he jumped into Hitler's arms like a waterfront whore when the troop ships pull into port. Churchill was determined not to cave in, but the Brits hauled ass out of Greece and they hauled ass out of Yugoslavia. When the Brits hauled ass out of France, they managed to leave all their guns behind at Dunkirk. Damned if I know why. The folks in England finally figured out they were next on Hitler's shopping list so they hunted up all the grouse guns and hunting rifles in the country, which wasn't much against MG-34 belt feds and MP-40 submachine guns. They were so desperate they even ran to museums and got spears, since they didn't have anything to fight with. We shipped over boatloads of real guns, but England still would have been fucked if Germany hadn't declared war on us a few days after Pearl Harbor, which was why we went over and saved their bacon. Henry realized he had gotten off the subject. Those old guys they showed in the movie? The ones who had been in the Resistance? They said right on film that the only reason they were in the Resistance at all was that they were communists, and Stalin told them Hitler was almost to Moscow. People in France viewed those guys as a bunch of nuts. That was the Resistance movement. How do you know so much about it? Henry shrugged. Went to a good high school. My dad was a history teacher at a local college, and other relatives of mine were right in the middle of the worst of it with the Nazis. They've all told me what it was like, the way it was for them while it was happening. By the middle of 1941, Krauts owned all of Europe except Switzerland and England. Germany had the war won, just about. Switzerland, of course, would have kept its independence, just like today. In 1941, every Swiss citizen had a machine gun and a bunch of ammo in his house. They've been practicing blowing their bridges and carrying out mountain ambushes for a couple centuries. So they were ready to slaughter the Krauts in the Alps and get back home in time for dinner. Hitler wasn't about to fuck with that country, even with Mussolini's dick in his hands. But Great Britain was hanging on by its fingertips, and old Joe Kennedy, our ambassador to England, he was sending back cables to Roosevelt saying, Hey pal, you're backing the wrong horse in this one. Henry shook his head. You don't go to sleep one night a free man and wake up the next morning to find you're a slave in your own country. It happens gradually. 
And when you realize it, it's too late. He looked at his friend. You know about frogs and hot water? The young man shook his head. Toss a frog in a pot of boiling water, and he'll jump out because it's boiling. That's like you looking at a picture of Jews being used for medical experiments at a concentration camp. Ah, how awful, Henry mimicked. But stick the frog in a pot of room temperature water and put it on the stove, and he'll swim around happily until he's dead. <laughs> Henry laughed without humor. And that's why when you see these people in France and Holland and Norway and Luxembourg and Denmark and Belgium and Yugoslavia and Great Britain let themselves get put in a position of helplessness, they had to beg for a country which hadn't been so stupid to bail them out. What do you mean? Those countries didn't have guns? I don't believe that. There's no way. The Germans just had more tanks and cannons and bombs and all of that. Oh sure, they had guns, but almost all of them were in the military. The people didn't have jack shit. We actually airdropped a bunch of stamped steel single-shot 45 pistols called the Liberator into occupied France to try and help them out. The damn thing didn't even have a rifled barrel. It was a smoothbore. Basically a zip gun. A real piece of junk. That was how little the French people had to protect their freedom with. And about the cannons and bombs, they work real well when all you've got to worry about is knocking out some fortified spots. They don't solve your problem when every single citizen of the country you're invading has a good rifle and knows how to use it. Hell. Some Jews in the Warsaw Ghetto who didn't know a thing about shooting held off the German army for over a month. And all the guns they had wouldn't fill up the trunk of that there car. Henry said, pointing to a 1969 Chevrolet Impala. Every time German army troops looked for him, a bullet would come out of a window somewhere and zap the commanding officer. Krauts finally had to burn the whole city down to kill them. And speaking of guns and protecting yourself, I've got to get cracking. The thing I'm teaching at UMass has its first session in about 20 minutes. Catch you in Geo class, rock jock. <laughs> Henry started to jog towards the campus parking lot. Henry's friend watched him go. For quite a long time, he thought about the things Henry Bowman had said. Later, Good evening. Welcome to class. I know a few of you already, but for those I haven't met, my name is Henry Bowman. He looked out at the group in front of him, and saw a few skeptical looks. This was originally planned as a co-ed class, but there appears to be little or no interest among the men in the area. At least, not right now. I suspect that at least some of you are here out of curiosity, and aren't at all sure what this course is about, or if you want to take it. You can't ask anyone to advise you about it either, because this is the first time that I've taught it. I'm going to ask that you agree to one thing. I know that really listening carefully is extremely tiring. An hour of it, if you really do it, is exhausting. I'm going to ask that you listen to me carefully for 10 minutes, with an open mind about what you hear. I'll warn you right now that I'm going to say some things that will almost certainly upset you, and that you will disagree with. When that happens, I want you to promise me for the next 10 minutes you will not tune out and quit listening. I want you to promise that you will not spend all of your time preoccupied with the outrageous thing I just said and miss what comes next. I want you to promise me that for 10 minutes, and 10 minutes only, you will pay absolute attention to every word I say as if your life depended on it. After 10 minutes is up, I want each of you to think about what I've said and decide if you want to listen to anything else I have to say. If not, I won't ask for any more of your time. Does that sound fair? There were several startled murmurs among the young women in the lecture hall. Henry saw a few tentative nods of acceptance. Okay. Good. Ten minutes. Henry Bowman took a deep breath and made eye contact with each and every one of the seventeen women in front of him. A close relative of mine was violently gang-raped. The rapists were talking about blinding her so they could not identify them when they were interrupted by a stranger, and they ran. Henry breathed deeply and went on. The rape left her physically injured and emotionally devastated. The physical injuries have healed. The emotional damage will take longer. 
Some of you may have stories you could tell about one of your own relatives, friends, or perhaps about yourself. He nodded, deciding what would come next. I've studied everything I could about that rape and others, so that the terrible price that the victim paid would not have been for nothing. That's why I'm here talking about personal protection today. Personal protection, Henry said in a loud voice. When you signed up for this not-for-credit course that the university agreed to offer and that I volunteered to teach, all of you had your own ideas of what personal protection meant. And those ideas were probably all different. What I think each of you shares is a realization that there are times in your life when you are not safe, and you want to do something about it. And that something, whatever it is, is important enough that you came to a not-for-credit class you know nothing about other than its title, taught by someone you've never heard of on the off chance that it might give you something of value. This course is going to teach you how to avoid becoming a victim of violent crime. Now, I am not going to tell you how to keep your dorm room from being burglarized when you are out, how to prevent the girl down the hall from stealing your checks and looting your bank account, or how to keep your jewelry from being taken while you're in the shower. Those things aren't important enough for me to bother with. I won't mince words here. The course I'm going to teach is how to see to it that you never, ever become the victim of a violent physical attack that results in rape, crippling injury, lasting emotional damage, or death. Henry looked around and saw that he had their undivided attention. I am also not going to tell you how to rearrange your life so that you avoid all situations with any potential for danger. Frankly, I don't think that can be done. Even if it could, I would still not be willing to let violent predators dictate the way in which I live my life. If you're willing to stay inside a locked building and only venture out in big groups, you don't need me or anyone else to teach you how to do it. What I am going to teach you is how to be prepared for the sudden, unexpected, violent attack so that if it ever does come, you will instantly do the thing that has the greatest chance of stopping that attack and saving both your dignity and perhaps your life. Still got their interest, Henry thought. Good. He strolled casually across the front of the lecture hall as he talked, his hands behind his back. Henry sat back against the table at the front of the room and palmed a new, white tennis ball from his open gym bag behind him. I am going to help you gain skill and confidence. I am going to help you develop certain reactions until they are instinctive. Without warning, he tossed the tennis ball underhand to a girl in the fourth row. As the ball arced towards her through the air, she looked very startled, then recovered, dropped her pen, reached out her hands, and caught the ball. Henry smiled and looked around the rest of the class. I'd like all of you to think about what you just saw. In less than one second, this woman did a whole list of things instinctively. She recognized that something was suddenly flying through the air at her. She identified it as a slow-moving tennis ball and therefore not a danger to her. She let go of the pen she was holding, she analyzed the trajectory of the ball, and brought her hands up to the proper position. Then, the instant the tennis ball touched her hands, she closed her fingers around it before it could bounce out. Less than one second. She wasn't born with that skill. Try what I just did with a two-year-old, and you'll be lucky if she even blinks before the ball bounces off her head. He smiled and nodded at the woman holding the ball. No one noticed that as he talked, Henry took a butter knife from his pocket and concealed it in the palm of his right hand. The difference is that in 20 years, each of you have seen a lot of things flying through the air. He was strolling in front of the three women in the front row as he spoke. The one nearest him was a muscular, athletic-looking brunette. You've all had enough snowballs, tennis balls, car keys, and frisbees tossed or thrown at you that you react without thinking. You duck the snowball and reach out for the car keys even when there's no warning. As he spoke these words, he stepped next to the brunette so that his hip was almost touching her shoulder and held the polished knife against the far side of her neck. One sound and I'll cut you bad, cunt, Henry said in a savage whisper. <gasps> There was a collective gasp from almost the entire class. A few of the women, including the one he had addressed, froze silently in utter shock. 
Henry waited to a count of five, then stepped back, held up the butter knife, and ran it roughly across his hand to show how dull it was. None of you had anything like that happen often enough to have developed any kind of instinctive response. Every single one of you froze. Henry stepped to the table and picked up the gym bag. My time isn't up yet, he warned the class as a whole, then held the bag out to the woman he had just pretended to threaten. She shied away from him. Soap, clean towels, and fresh sweats in here. Second door on the left in the hallway. Wash your face in cold water and come back, he whispered. Go. The girl took the bag and Henry could see she was about to get up and run out of the room. She glared at him, then looked at her watch. In six minutes, when you're done, she hissed, slouching back in her seat. Henry nodded in approval and turned to the class. To cope with the situation I just demonstrated, you need three things. First, you need experience and preparation so that the unexpected does not paralyze you. You need to be ready for what I just did. You need to be just as familiar and prepared as you would be with a snowball flying at you in the middle of January. Second, you need to learn what to do, and then work on it, so that your instinctive reaction is the right one and not something that will make the problem worse. Defending against violence is a lot more complicated than ducking a snowball, and because of that, it takes a lot more practice. The third thing you need is something that I have never seen mentioned in any discussion of personal protection and defense. It is also the one thing that is far and away the most important. For want of a better term, I call it the warrior mentality. And it's something I'm going to stress over and over in this class. If you have it, you're going to have the greatest possible likelihood of retaining not only your life and good health, but also your dignity and self-respect. As Henry looked at the 17 faces, he saw interest, hostility, disbelief, curiosity, puzzlement, and skepticism. He did not see boredom. I'm going to ask all of you to imagine something. And then I'd like one of you to volunteer to pretend you're being interviewed. He gave what happened with a self-efficating smile. I won't threaten you, yell, or use bad language. I'll stand right here, I promise. Henry licked his lips and went on. Imagine for a moment that tonight you were the victim of a premeditated, intentional assault. It was dark. You got some bruises in the attack and the attacker ran off. I'll let you decide the other circumstances and the specifics of the assault. The hospital people looked you over, calmed you down, and you're shaken but okay. The soreness seems to be gradually going away. He looked at each student in turn. Anyone willing to be interviewed? Silence lasted a few seconds. Then one young woman spoke. She was of medium height and wore tennis shoes, cut off shorts, and a t-shirt. Henry could see that she was lean and muscular with long, slender legs and good calves. She looked as if she spent a lot of time outside. Yeah, go ahead, she told him. Henry smiled at her and nodded. Ma'am, Henry stated, I understand that today a man assaulted you, and you were roughed up. Can you tell me something about exactly what happened? I was walking to my car. As I was getting my keys out of my purse, suddenly there was a man beside me. I don't know if he'd been following me or what. He tried to take my purse. How did he do that? He grabbed at it. He, uh, he just tried to rip it out of my hands. I wasn't thinking. I held on to it. It was instinctive, you know? Someone tries to pull something out of your hands, you just hold tighter. Henry saw some of the others nodding, and he did the same. He could tell the woman was getting involved with the roleplay. So then what happened? I, uh, started to scream. Before I could, th before I, I, before I could though, he, he hit me with his fist. He hit me in the jaw. I felt this terrible pain in my face and, and I fell down. My wrist is sore too. Did he get your purse? Uh, yes, he ran away with it. Anything in it he could use? Money? Credit cards? Yes, both of those. I see, Henry said. Is this woman really role-playing, or did something like this actually happen to her? He wondered. If you don't mind my saying so, you certainly look very athletic, he said, changing the subject. 
Why didn't you just run away? The young woman actually smiled at the question. I was wearing heels and a long skirt at the time. I was returning from a job interview. But the man surprised me. Even if I'd had on my track shoes, I probably would have done the same thing. Holding on to the purse was, as you were talking about, instinctive. Any guess why the man picked you? Henry asked, changing the subject again. I was there, she said simply. Maybe I looked preoccupied and he saw that as an opportunity. I have no idea. Did you learn anything from this experience? Anything you'll do differently now when returning to your car after job interviews? I'll look around more. I'll be more aware of where I am and who's nearby. I'll uh, try to find someone to walk with when I have to go someplace where it's dark or where it's deserted. I don't think it would have happened if there had been other people around. Well, maybe it still would have, she said, reconsidering, but not as likely. Henry nodded encouragingly. So, you've already planned a number of good steps to reduce the chance that this will happen to you again in the future. Uh, yes. With his peripheral vision, Henry Bowman could see that the others in the room were nodding slightly and paying close attention. You're not worried about this man attacking you again? Henry asked with concern. Uh, no, why? The woman was baffled now. Henry looked incredulous. He's got your credit card and driver's license, so he knows where you live. He's seen your car, and he's got the keys to both it and your apartment. Knowing you'd be stranded, unable to drive your car right away, and that you'd go to a doctor, he probably went straight to your place, let himself in, and rigged a window or two so he could get in later if you changed the locks right away. But I guess you weren't thinking about your own safety. You were much too overcome with guilt. The entire lecture hall was silent. What guilt? The young woman demanded, her eyes boring holes into his. It wasn't my fault I got attacked. No, it wasn't. But you learned several things from this attack. You told us that. Well, so did the man who robbed you. Henry held up a fist and began to tick off points on his fingers. First of all, he learned that robbing lone women in parking lots is easy. Second, he learned that it is a viable way to get money and access to vehicles and new victims. Third, he learned the victims sometimes resist a little, so he learned to hit them to make them do what he wants. Maybe he's learned that lesson well enough that next time he'll carry a lead pipe and hit the person first so he doesn't have that problem. Henry pretended to have just thought of something. You know, I just realized, if you've got a roommate and she was home when the attacker used your keys to let himself into your apartment, she may well be dead by now. Or maybe she's just injured. If you're lucky, maybe the guy just scared the hell out of her as he did you. If she is dead though, then you'll have to ask the coroner to find out if she was raped first. She won't be able to tell you. People tend to have friends that are like them and a woman's purse tells a lot about its owner. If your purse had an address book in it, you've given this man a bunch of names, addresses, and unlisted phone numbers of new victims to choose from. Maybe when the man... Maybe when the man saw how you resisted, he decided from now on to stick to older victims. Maybe he'll punch out elderly people whose bodies can't take the kind of shocks yours can. We don't know the answer to that question. What we do know... Henry said, raising his voice, is that this man is not going to take your purse, go back to his apartment and say, ah, my final mugging. Time to look through the wanted ads and find a good job. He's going to keep at it. The other thing I can absolutely guarantee you is that you will not help put this man in jail now. Eyewitness testimony is the least reliable kind of evidence. If you identify a suspect in a lineup and claim that beyond doubt he's the one, you may well be helping to imprison an innocent man. Henry saw that the young woman was cowed and her eyes were filled with tears, but he pressed on. The time to do something is when you have the mugger right in front of you. The time to fight is when you are strong, not after you've been beaten. And the time and place to lose your dignity is in here, with me where you'll get it back in five or ten minutes and you won't be left lying on the ground, bruised at best and maybe permanently crippled, with guilt eating you at your guts that he's going to do it again to someone else because you didn't stop him. 
<sighs> Henry Bowman took a very deep breath and made eye contact with each of the pupils before him. Every one of them was waiting for his next words. My ten minutes are up. No one replied. If you elect to stay in this course, you will be forced to face more issues such as the one you're thinking about right now. You will not hear about rape whistles and sisterhood support groups. If you stay in this course, you will learn why the worst handgun is ten times better than the next best choice for saving your life. You will learn how to carry one safely at all times when it is possible, and how to improvise other methods of defense when it is not. You will develop the will to kill a violent attacker if necessary. You will learn exactly how to do it, and you will learn when to do it. Henry looked at the woman he had just interrogated. Are you willing to face those issues? He asked gently. The woman hesitated. Yes, she said finally, with a firm nod. Me too, the first woman broke in. When you stuck that knife at my throat, I wet my pants and I wanted to rip your damn balls off. The other students became very animated at this revelation. You knew it too, didn't you? That's why there's towels and sweats in the bag, Henry said with a smile. He tapped his groin area with a ballpoint pen, and there was an unexpected sound. Also have on a plastic cup in case you did more than just think about it. Preparation is everything, <laughs> he said with a smile and arched his eyebrows. The class erupted, and Henry handed the woman the gym bag. So, who's staying? he asked the group. The response was unanimous, and Henry was startled to see expressions of raw sexual interest on several faces in the group. Okay, fella, Henry thought as his heart rate accelerated. Don't get too excited now. That's the kind of thinking that's apt to screw this up big time. Bowman's boot camp, as it came to be known in the Pioneer Valley, was a success. In the two years before he graduated from college and left the area, Henry would teach over 300 women and 40 men. Henry would suspect, correctly, that most of the men were homosexuals who feared injury or death at the hands of fag bashers. In the period prior to Henry Bowman's graduation, several of Henry's former pupils would use what they had learned to stop violent assaults in the act and take the time to send Henry letters and newspaper clippings describing the events. Two of the letter writers would credit Henry Bowman with saving their lives. Henry Bowman would be very proud of these letters and would value them more than his diploma. Bowman's boot camp, as it came to be known in the Pioneer Valley, was a success. In the two years before he graduated from college and left the area, Henry Bowman would teach over 300 women and 40 men. Henry would suspect, correctly, that most of the men were homosexuals who feared injury or death at the hands of fag bashers. In the period prior to Henry Bowman's graduation, several of Henry's former pupils would use what they had learned to stop violent assaults in the act and take the time to send Henry letters and newspaper clippings describing the events. Two of the letter writers would credit Henry Bowman with saving their lives. Henry Bowman would be very proud of these letters and would value them more than his diploma. The sexual undercurrent that Henry Bowman noticed that first evening would be present to some degree in every class he taught, and Henry quickly came to see why so many college professors ended up having affairs with their pupils. The sexual undercurrent that Henry Bowman noticed that first evening would be present to some degree in every class he taught, and Henry quickly came to see why so many college professors ended up having affairs with their pupils. Henry Bowman made a rule for himself that his own students were off-limits until the last of the six evening sessions was over, but former students were just like any other girls his own age in a college town. Much to Henry's chagrin, he found that his female students' romantic interest in him generally disappeared after the course was over. In a few cases, though, it did not. And in the following two years, Henry ended up having three very pleasant involvements with women who had been in his personal protection class. Each of these three women would bestow on Henry Bowman a great deal of physical pleasure. One of them, however, would do him a favor that would prove to be of more lasting value. New chapter here. Here on page 286 of the ebook edition and page 332 of the softcover print edition, we have... 
Chapter 95. April Fools. April 1st, 1973. April 1st, 1973. Bill will never let you back on the field if he finds out, George Govea said. You'll have to jump at Turner Falls from now on. Henry Bowman nodded with pleasure that George had not made some whiny comment about fearing for his own job at the parachuting school. It was one of the reasons that George was Henry's favorite employee at the Orange Sport Parachuting Center. We've got to do it. It's April Fool's, remember? Henry said. Look, we'll load up on the other side of the pumps. Bill won't see me taxi, and after that, there's no proof, right? <laughs> I mean, I guess you're right. No one's going to believe a chick throwing a hissy fit. Will the pilot go along with it? Henry asked. George snorted. <laughs> He'll probably pay you to do it. He's got some other flying job lined up, and he's quitting in two weeks anyway. Then it's a go. Next jump run? Yeah, but we need a fifth person. We don't want Tom. He'd probably tell Stephanie, and you know how she is. Bill will never let you back on the field if he finds out, George Govea said. You'll have to jump at Turner Falls from now on. Henry Bowman noted with pleasure that George had not made some whiny comment about fearing for his own job at the parachuting school. It was one of the reasons that George was Henry's favorite employee at the Orange Sport Parachuting Center. We've got to do it. It's April Fool's, remember? Henry said. Look, we'll load up on the other side of the pumps. Bill won't see me taxi, and after that, there's no proof, right? I mean, I guess you're right. No one's going to believe a chick throwing a hissy fit. Will the pilot go along with it? Henry asked. <laughs> George snorted. He'd probably pay you to do it. He's got some other flying job lined up, and he's quitting in two weeks anyway. Then it's a go? Next jump run? Yeah, but we need a fifth person. We don't want Tom. He'd probably tell Stephanie, and you know how she is. Keith might try to feel me up. Rick's not here. <laughs> we wouldn't want him. Lightning might strike twice. <laughs> Henry warned with a laugh. <laughs> yeah, no shit. <laughs> George replied and broke up also. Is Carl Beck here? Haven't seen him today. Jesus, wouldn't he be perfect, though? Carl Beck was a cadaverous, one-eyed World War II vet. He had been shot to ribbons and left for dead in the European theater, and his sewn-up eye socket, torturous limp, ruined jaw, and wispy hair made him look like an extra in a Boris Karloff movie. Carl had done the logical thing for a man who was completely disabled. He had taken up sport parachuting. In freefall, his disabilities vanished, and everyone on the airport liked jumping with Carl. He was a bit lackadaisical about packing his main parachute, however, and the joke at Orange was that Carl Beck was the only man around who could qualify for a Class A license, which required 25 jumps on his reserve chute. Some years later, Carl would have his reserve chute fail as well, and he would land in a muddy drainage ditch at an estimated 85 miles an hour. After that, his limp became even worse, but he kept jumping. What about Franny, then? She's here. Would she pitch a bitch? Hell no. Yeah, she'd be perfect, and Bill will believe her if it comes to that. Great, Henry said. Here, give what's-his-name the pilot... Give him my helmet to wear and make sure he knows to go rich before restart. And make damn sure that even if she freaks out, that girl doesn't pull inside the plane, okay? That would ruin your day. Uh, yeah, I can take care of that. Good point. We'll stick her in the far back. Just in case. I'll trim it up for best glide with no power before I go. And, uh, George, since I won't be there to see it, milk it real good, okay? Act as if you're all snarled up and can't get out for a while before letting the pilot take over, huh? This is going to be a good one, Henry, George Govea said with a big grin. Henry Bowman nodded and started walking towards the shack which served as the airport restaurant. Like most activities that could loosely be called thrill sports, sport parachuting in 1973 was an actively practiced primary by young men. College students of both sexes drove up to Orange every weekend to make the first and only parachute jump of their lives so they could say that they'd done it. Very few women of that era, however, ever became experienced jumpers with instructor's ratings, or had jump logbooks with hundreds of entries. 
Those that did achieve such measures of proficiency, however, were accepted as equals. Fast Franny Stramenos was one of that group. Like most all experienced jumpers, she liked a good gotcha, and more importantly, she felt no particular kinship to non-jumpers merely because they were of the same gender. That was important for what was about to happen. At Orange, as at every commercial drop zone in the country, an interested party could pay the same fee that the jumpers paid for their airlift and go on an observation flight. This meant that he or she got to ride in the plane with the parachutists, watch them jump out, and then land in the plane along with the pilot. Safety regulations required that in single-engine jump planes, all non-parachutists had to wear an emergency parachute in case of engine failure. Henry Bowman always thought this was a crazy rule. Jump planes stayed directly over whatever drop zone they serviced, and any pilot who had an engine failure directly over an airport and elected to abandon his aircraft did not deserve to have a pilot's license in the first place, in Henry's opinion. In spite of that, all drop zones around the country followed the rule. Pilots and observers in single-engine jump planes wore emergency parachutes. At almost every drop zone around the country, there was an equally important unwritten rule that the staff also followed. It took effect only when an exceptionally good-looking female signed up for an observation flight on a plane full of instructors and other experienced jumpers. The unwritten rule was that when the airplane got to jump altitude, the pilot pulled the throttle back to idle and told the observer that the engine had lost power and she was going to have to jump with the others. This practice had been going on almost as long as there had been sport jumpers and attractive female observers. Usually, the woman would turn pale and occasionally screamed before the pilot opened the throttle and let her in on the joke. One young lady at Orange the year before had greatly endeared herself to the instructors. When given the news, she had nodded once in acceptance and then started to climb over the right seat of the Beach 18 to get to the door at the rear of the plane. The beach was a twin, but the instructor had put a shoot on her anyway, and the pilot had chopped both throttles. There were other good stories that the instructors liked to retell, but Henry's favorite was the legendary one that had occurred when the instructors had pulled the trick on a woman in a ten-person Nordoyan Norseman. The Orange facility owned three Norse hogs, which were slow-flying 1940s-era military cargo aircraft, each powered by a single big radial engine. On the afternoon in question, the pilot gave the standard bad news to the observer, and then, as was custom, one of the instructors gave her the good news that it was just a joke. In this case, an instructor with the unlikely name of Rick Hustler had done the honors. What happened next varied according to who was telling the story and how much he'd had to drink. What was not disputed was that the young woman threw her arms around Rick Hustler's neck and said, Oh, thank you, thank you, or some other equally appropriate words of gratitude. The second thing that was never disputed was that when the plane passed over the exit point, Rick Hustler elected not to jump out of the aircraft with the rest of the jumpers and actually landed in the plane with his new admirer. What transpired between the time the jumpers exited and the time the plane landed was cause for great speculation. But there was a third undisputed fact about the incident. Within a year, Rick Hustler and the young woman were husband and wife. Henry Bowman was about to elevate this standard drop zone prank into an art form. He didn't know it, but in so doing, he was also going to help the pilot get what he would later say was, the best blowjob I ever had in my life. Since Henry did not know the man well, he would be unable to assess whether this was an impressive claim or not. Henry smiled as he bit into his hamburger. Henry thought the Orange Airport hamburgers were the best thing to be had in Massachusetts. When he saw through the restaurant window that the four people were standing around the Cessna 180 waiting for the pilot, Henry popped the last bite into his mouth and ran out the door. Uh, sorry I'm late, Henry apologized as he slowed to a walk in front of the group. Oh, no problem, Franny Stremeno said immediately. I was just telling Debbie here the most comfortable way to sit. She's never been cramped up in a plane with no seats. Hmm, well. Let's get in then, said the man whose name Henry had forgotten. He was wearing a single emergency shoot. I haven't made any jumps yet today. Henry and George bit their lips to keep from laughing. 
The Cessna 180 was set up as a jump aircraft, which meant it had all its seats removed save the one for the pilot, and would now hold five people instead of four. A special jump door had been installed that hinged at the top and could be opened all the way in flight. The observer got in first and sat with her knees bunched up alongside the rear bulkhead. Franz Tremenos sat facing her, and George got in next. Then Henry climbed into the pilot's seat, and the other man sat on the floor where the passenger seat would normally have been, facing forward. Henry Bowman quickly ran through the pre-flight checklist and started the engine. He taxied the plane immediately and kept his face turned to the left. He did not want the drop zone's owner to see that the man who was flying his jump aircraft was not the person he had hired to perform that job. The 180 was a tailwheel airplane like Henry's acrobatic cub, and its ground handling was similar, although the pedal effort was higher. Henry taxied to the end of the runway, did his engine run-up and magneto check, mumbled something unintelligible into the microphone, and pulled out onto the runway centerline. He pushed the throttle to full and held the yoke forward, keeping the plane straight with quick stabs on the rudder pedals. As the tail came up, he eased the yoke back and let the airplane fly itself off the runway. Decent power for a spam can, he thought with a smile. Henry had a tube and rag pilot's disdain for all metal airplanes. Although modern equipment allows sport parachutists to glide to a landing virtually anywhere they choose, in 1973 many jumpers had chutes of limited maneuverability, and the first high-performance glide reserve chutes were still six years away. Thus, jumpers always strove to exit the aircraft at the proper point upwind of their intended landing spot, so that if they ended up having to deploy a non-steerable reserve chute, they would still end up somewhere on the airport and not in the woods. Normally, when a jump aircraft gets to jump altitude, this is accomplished by one of the jumpers opening the door, holding his head out so he can see straight down and giving the pilot hand corrections to put him over a spot that has been pre-selected based on other jump runs or a test with a crepe paper streamer. On this flight, however, Henry Bowman was going to have to guess. It took Henry 17 minutes of circling the airport to get to an altitude of 7,500 feet above the ground. By that time, he had a good feel for the wind velocity and direction and he turned the aircraft into the wind and flew directly over the big sand landing bowl that was in the center of the three runways. A quarter mile past the parachutist's intended landing point, Henry Bowman trimmed the airplane a little nose up, pulled the mixture control to full lean, and brought the throttle back to idle position. Out of the corner of his eye, he saw the jump pilot on the floor next to him draw his breath in sharply. In four seconds, the engine sputtered and stopped running. Henry had just fuel-starved it. The airplane was suddenly very quiet. What's wrong? Franny Stremenos yelled, her voice almost cracking. Nice touch, Franny, Henry Bowman thought with a smile. Perpetuate the stereotype, why don't you? <laughs> I, I don't know, Henry yelled back. Bill warned me the jetting was off, but he said we couldn't afford to have the plane in the shop. Henry saw the pilot's face turn bright red as the man forced himself to contain his laughter. All the employees thought the airport owner was a tightwad. Henry put his right hand on the ignition key, looked at the man on the floor next to him, arched his eyebrows, and removed the key. A look of horrified comprehension came over the man's face, and he grabbed Henry's wrist. Henry slid the key back into the ignition, let go of it, and winked. Just checking to see if you were paying attention. <laughs> is the plane gonna crash? The shapely woman in the back of the plane screamed as she strained to see what was going on. Henry turned around in the pilot's seat and made sure he had solid eye contact with the girl before he spoke. Well, I'm sure his shit not gonna stay in it and find out, he said in a loud voice. Then he reached across the real pilot's outstretched legs, unlatched the jump door, and swung it up against the wing. Henry stared into the girl's eyes once more. See you on the ground, he said. Then Henry Bowman dove headfirst out of the aircraft. Henry bent slightly forward at the waist and bent his elbows so that he would fall in a back-to-earth position. He wanted to watch the airplane to see what would happen. Since the pilot had borrowed Henry's goggles as well as his helmet, Henry squinted so that his eyes wouldn't tear. It was a full ten seconds before he saw a bright red jumpsuit appear. There's Franny. 
He glanced at the altimeter on his chest strap. 6,300 feet. Henry watched the plane for another 10 count, but George didn't exit, so he flipped to a face-to-earth position, glanced at his altimeter, and got his bearings. 4,800 feet. Need to get over the north edge of the farmer's field. Henry bent sideways at the waist to turn towards the field, then drew his arms in to his sides, cupped his hands forward, hunched his shoulders, and pointed his toes. He was now falling in a track, traveling almost one foot horizontally for every four feet down. His speed through the air was over 200 miles per hour. At 3,000 feet, Henry was over the proper spot, and his... <clears throat> Actually, let me fucking pause and get some conversions here, because goddamn metric is not imperial. Here's some blooper reel from the six or seven minute mark. <laughs> Fuck, I think we killed him! Okay, it is... 17.47 or 5.47 p.m. on Thursday, April 13th, 2023. Obviously, I'm going to have to cut this whole section here at the end, but suffice it to say, this has taken me a very, very long time to get to editing. God damn. God damn. I need to finish this section and get this thing published at some point soon. All right, that's all. Let me know what y'all think. Peace.